So Mary, are there any exciting developments this year at the CND? Yeah, so this year at CND, obviously there was a high-level segment that marked the midterm review of the 2019 political declaration on drugs. The official proceedings were very disappointing. The outcome document is incredibly disappointing. The wording is very vague. It doesn't acknowledge any of the failings of the war on drugs. However, something that has really marked the midterm review is the fact that Colombia put together a statement on behalf of 60 countries. Many of them are members of the actual CND to call for a review of the current approach and show that the approach is not working and we need to rethink the strategy on drugs at global level. And we can see this with one of the resolutions, which is on overdose prevention, that is led by the United States. And for the first time, it includes harm reduction in its title. And it's an important sign because the US was one of the countries that was pushing back on harm reduction in the past. The human rights system is much more engaged uh, in Vienna and in drug policy in general than ever before. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has released a report on the human rights implications of drug policies and it calls for the end of the war on drugs. It calls for the responsible regulation of drugs, of all drugs. It's the first UN agency, I think, that is so strong in its position on this, so it's a fantastic sign. I did a lot of time in reflection. I had the time to understand who I am. Release has been a vocal proponent of decriminalization. What do we mean by decriminalization? It is the removal of criminal sanctions for uh, possession and use of drugs. If you look around the world, is there any model of decriminalization which is closest to your heart, which you would highly recommend? I think my favorite model is Spain. So Spain decriminalized all drugs back in the 1980s through a constitutional court decision, which determined that people had a right over their own bodies, a right to privacy. And so they permit the possession and social supply of any controlled drug in private settings. Now, the thing I don't like about Spain is that they have administrative fines for public possession, which the police are very happy to use. So it still can lead to over-policing. We learned new words recently, and one of these new words is recriminalization. And as I've heard from the news in uh, Oregon, the state legislature is going to approve a bill that would recriminalize drug use. Is that correct? That is correct. The, the state legislature did pass a bill to recriminalize drug possession. Uh, it's still waiting for the governor to sign. How does it make you feel? Um, really angry. Decriminalization in Oregon was wrongfully blamed for homelessness, even though it's not connected. It's really connected to housing policies. During the COVID pandemic, there were housing policies that prohibited evictions, so somebody couldn't, were protected if they were in, in their housing. Months after decriminalization took effect, the state removed those restrictions. And so we saw these external factors of housing policies that led to a number of people who are unhoused now and are homeless and on the streets. The second thing is that the overdose rates in Oregon are directly tied to the arrival of fentanyl, which is a very powerful synthetic opioid. Fentanyl hit the markets on the West Coast, which includes Oregon around 2019 and 2020, and it coincided with the implementation of decriminalization. So I think there were two main external factors disconnected to decriminalization that opponents to any kind of progressive reform capitalized on and used it to put pressure on the legislature to do something. So what is your message to those people who will say that, oh, you know, decriminalization, we tried it in Oregon and it didn't work? I would say it is not true that it didn't work. Decriminalization was very effective. It meant that tens of thousands of people avoided a criminal record as a result of decriminalization for that very short period. As a result of decriminalization, the state has made massive investments in 
treatment and housing and harm reduction and supportive services that are needed for people. I would also say decriminalization is part of a you know, whole series of steps that need to be taken to truly adopt a public health approach. We have got this discussion now for uh, in Norway about decriminalization because we shall remove the stigma. Criminalization hinders people from, from seeking help, receiving help. And they say that it, will, it will stop the stigmatization of people. Well, it's a, that decriminalization is about police running after us in the streets, but then and they take us, they take the drugs from us, but then we're not going to uh, punish you. We're just going to force you to go into there, there to get help. How is that destigmatizing? It's not. It's the prohibition that is the main problem. We have to end this taboo. We have to break the, the taboo and, and move forward. We are Europe. We are for democracy. And now we have an end enemy against the democracy inside our own countries because of organized crime. Uh, they're killing journalists, they're killing politicians, they're killing advocates, they're killing people just passing by, and they are infiltrating political parties, infiltrating this, the, the welfare system to launder the money. They're destroying our democracy from inside. We cannot do that anymore. And what we can do, you can open up for those who use the most drugs. I, I think there, there may be 10% of the drug users use 70 or 80% of the drugs. Well, make it legally available for them. What developments we see around the world in terms of re regulation? The very exciting thing around this year at CND is that there is more and more visibility given to regu legal regulation. Around the world there are quite a few jurisdictions that have uh, legally regulated markets, I mean many jurisdictions in the US, but then all corners of the world, right? So you've got Uruguay, you've got Thailand, there's quite a few European countries including the Czech Republic and others, uh, Germany, that are about to adopt legally regulated markets for, for cannabis. Germany ran into problems with uh, the European Commission because a full uh, chain from growing to retail on a commercial level is not allowed by EU law, but everything for personal use is allowed in the sense that countries can decide on that themselves. That is the, the framework decision of 2004. So what they did now is to have home cultivation for personal use and collective home, home cultivation, you could say, in cannabis clubs you cannot uh, use there for instance but you, yeah, you can buy your cannabis there 25 grams Luxembourg also got a new elections center right government now but they kept at least the home cultivation and of course Malta has uh, home growing and cannabis clubs and uh, yeah that seems to become maybe the new model in Europe except for the Dutch. In your, your view how do you compare these two models like the cannabis club model or the coffee shop model in the Netherlands? Well, what worries me is a corporate capture of the cannabis market and that you get large com companies which are difficult to control. I would rather have a more controlled model, but it has to be in such a way that access is not complicated too much, that people have easy access to, to cannabis without it being a commercial model. And the Dutch model is commercial. Do you think that some European governments could do the same what Bol Bolivia did with coca in case of cannabis, like they resign from the conventions, rejoin without accepting the cannabis related parts? If they want to move to a more liberated market, they have to do that. And we have proposed that you can have a model with yeah, like the Bolivian route, you can also have inter se uh, modification of the conventions. And you have to do that because the e EU law is based, is very much intertwined with the conventions. If you want to uh, change things according to EU law, you have to do something with the conventions first. Certainly not at this time when international law is already very fragile. You see Palestine and Ukraine, anyone wants to meddle with international law. It's going to all depend on what is going to happen in the United States. If at the federal level cannabis will be legally regulated, then I think things at the international level might start moving. I read in the media that uh, 
the cannabis reform law that was accepted, I adopted like a few years ago, it, it is now being reversed or already reversed. Can you explain us the situation? Thailand has re um, removed the scheduling of cannabis from our narcotics list. And we are in the space of it's being in the control herb right now, but the regulation for the control herb is not enough for cannabis to actually, you know, to regulate cannabis properly. So the government is looking at coming out with the Cannabis Act, but at the same time, as civil society, we also have our own Cannabis Act that goes in to Parliament as well. We got our um, 10,000 petition members and we're just waiting for the Prime Minister to sign so that we hope that we at least get to be in the room of the committee when the final draft gets drawn. How would you re regulate cannabis in Thailand if it was your place to decide? Ooh. Um, I would like to see a couple of models. I like the non-commercial model, especially for the locals, for trade. You know, like if you grow your own and then you trade with your friends, like the um, social club model is also quite good. But at the same time, we can't, ignore the commercialized model because Thailand is a very tourist um, country and that's where a lot of our economic comes in from the money. So we also need to have it available because otherwise they're just going to go underground. So the whole thing that I would like to bring up regarding regulation is you need to look at the ground, the grassroots, the people who's actually involved in this, how they do it and regulate what makes sense there rather than very high level and um, something that is very detached from reality. So for regulation to work, you need to make sure that your people also support it and that this is part of how the culture works and the society works. There is also momentum for other substances to be regulated, in particular at city level. So today we had a side event that focused on legal regulation and the, a representative of the mayor of Amsterdam came to talk about regulation of cannabis, but also cocaine and other substances. And I think it's high time that we have this conversation considering the toxic supply of substances and the harms that it can have on people who use drugs because the substances are not regulated. We have got heroin assisted treatment, we will get substitution treatment for other serious addiction. That's a revolution of the drug treatment. So we will get substitution treatment for benzodiazepines and for central stimulants. Can help people using uh, problematic use of MDMA, amphetamines and cocaine. The uh, substitution treatment for uh, central stimulants, it will be with dexamphetamine. It's ADHD medication. Could you do the same with cocaine? Yes, we can do the same with the cocaine, and I have read about uh, some experiment with coke paste and coke leaves pulverized. Of course, we should use coca product products also, but the coca leaf, it should be legal. The vice president of Bolivia was also there. One of the key issues that are being uh, discussed this year is the review of the coca leaf with a view to remove it from the international drug control system to protect the rights of indigenous peoples. We think, uh, as our president say, that dialogue is uh, what the world needs. And the coca helps to focus, to also to compromise, what compromise we make in circle for the well-being of the community or the group or the society, we discuss. If I understand you correctly, your people think that uh, coca has a sacred spiritual meaning, right? Totally, totally. Can totally. you explain that, like how? One of the este, teach is the offering, we call ofrenda. Offering comes from offer and give at the same time. Not just offers, you know, we offer and give. And when we came to our circle, every of us bring a bag of coca leaves and beautiful handmade textile bag with beautiful patterns, each other's. And we share, before we start any talking, we share the most beautiful leaves to each one of our circle of our family members. In, this, in those leaves, we blow to print our best intentions to each of our members of our family. We receive 
the love of all our circle. At the same time, when we receive, we eat and we start to collect in our mouth, taking the elixir of the Jewish, and this start to concentrate every word that come from us after we eat the coca, start to be sacred word, true word. All what you talk after eating is sacred. That's why it's very, very part of our spirituality. Many governments here at the UN say that coca is dangerous because uh, they produce cocaine from it and we should eradicate coca. What do you think about that? One coca leaves used for nutrition is one coca less for the narco-traffic. I can say that. This CND, the Commission will vote about bringing some new substances under the control of the UN treaties. How do you see this process? Well, you know, every day at the CND, a number of substances are scheduled and they will be banned, and there will be a unanimous vote to, to have them banned. And uh, maybe for some substances, it, it doesn't do any harm. But, you know, we do drug checking in the Netherlands, and we do that for so many years. And what we see when drugs are banned, when MPSs are banned, for instance, 3 MMC or a few years ago uh, for fluoramphetamine, that before the ban it's usually very pure, but right after the ban uh, it started getting contaminated with all kinds of other, maybe even more potent or risky uh, MPSs. How do you see the, the new trends in the European drug market in, let's say, the past five years? Is, are there any new developments? When it comes to cocaine, uh, we see the availability of uh, cocaine uh, ever increasing every year. Interesting with cocaine is that the purity seems to be going up still every year, year by year, while the price stays the same. So it means that there's a really an abundance of cocaine on the market. You have seen the emergence of nitazines in uh, some parts of Europe, more specifically in Ireland, in Wales and in Scotland and also in the UK. So in that part of, uh, of Europe, they are entering the market as a contamination of heroin, cocaine, or uh, benzodiazepines, but in other parts, like in the Netherlands, we're very close. We don't see it, luckily, so far. But it's a worrying trend, synthetic opioids entering the market. And actually, it may be fueled by the Taliban, uh, the ban on uh, the cultivation of opium. Um, probably by now or soon, the heroin uh, stash will be uh, uh, dried up. And we fear uh, that uh, heroin will be laced with uh, synthetic opioids or completely replaced by synthetic opioids if there's no heroin. What is the legal use of nitazine, if there is any? There isn't any for nitazines. So there, unlike fentanyl, you won't find like hospital prescribing or anything for nitazines. Can we say that this is a kind of product of the prohibition system? Yeah, I would definitely say so, especially where we're seeing it in the United States right now. As we're seeing increasing bans on precursors for fentanyl and fentanyl analog production, something's going to have to take up the space of that as well. And without safe supply and without comprehensive opiate substitution therapy access, it just creates a vacuum that another synthetic opioid is really well posed to fit. What has been the response from government so far? In Scotland, we've seen a bit more proactiveness. There was a round table specifically around the threats of synthetic opioids. There is increased willingness, obviously, there's moving forward with a drug consumption room. There's going to be pilot drug checking programs in multiple cities. We've definitely seen Wetanos be really forthright in Wales uh, that offers the national drug checking via post, being really forthright with what they're finding and issuing alerts and information. In the English context, unfortunately, like we're still a little bit behind as far as the UK goes. So the UN drug treaties were also made to provide or ensure access to controlled uh, substances as medicines. Do you think that the implementation of these treaties is efficient in this regard? No, and I'm going to go make a statement in the plenary about that now because 85% of the world still has no medicines. They're dying in terrible pain, suffering, living in terrible pain. And it's gotten worse because of the American narrative around the opioid crisis, which has nothing to do with opioids. It has everything to do with the pharmaceutical industry and lack of good regulation in the US because it's all about marketing. And the latest studies, really good research, has shown that it's about marketing, it's about the social and political determinants of health, and yet that affects access to medical opioids in so many countries, lower middle income countries. Even Europe, even in 
really some high-income countries, there's not good access to medicines because doctors aren't trained to prescribe them. It's so stigmatized. It's so stupid to stigmatize a molecule, but that's what's happened. You mentioned the overdose epidemic in the, in the US, in America. How do you see the roots uh, of, this, of this crisis? From the pharmaceutical industry, marketing expensive brand name opioids to doctors. They have what's called direct-to-consumer marketing is allowed in the States. It's not allowed in a lot of European countries because the regulatory agencies are underfunded. The public sector is so underfunded. There was one regulator and he at first said, no, you can't, you can't market it, this molecule and there are real problems with your application. And then they bought him. It's corruption. It's not a healthcare system. It's, it's a profit system for the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance companies. What about young people? Are young people here? Are they present at the CND? Yeah, so we do have a large cohort of young people, the more progressive young people as well, which is great. We still need to see more meaningful engagement of young people, not only as a token, um, of attendance, but really engaging in these policy processes. So the quotes that I love using, young people are not problems to be solved, but problem solvers ourselves. Yes, protect children and young people, but do it in a way that is ensuring that our needs are met and that we are included in from policy discussions, from policy decisions to implementation of programs. Make sure that we are involved in those processes. Civil society is not going anywhere. We keep holding our governments accountable. We keep holding the UN, uh, in particular UNODC, accountable for their failings in terms of drug policy and we'll continue to do that. And it's great that yeah, NGOs and particular community representatives, representatives of indigenous people, representatives of people who use drugs are very, very prominent more than ever in the debates at the UN level. Thank you.